Alhamdulillahi wa kafa Wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi al-lazina astafa Khususan ala afdalihim wa khatamin nabiyyin Muhammadin al-amin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Wa ba' Fa'audhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim Bismillahirrahmanirrahim وَنَزَّلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ تِبِيَانًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَهُدًا وَرَحْمَةً وَبُشْرًا لِلْمُسْلِمِينَ صدق الله العظيم Brother Chairman, respected Imam, brothers and sisters Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded in the Quran commanded us بَعَلَ أُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَعَتَسِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعٌ وَلَا تَفَرَّكُوا Hold on all of you Hold on to the rope of Allah which is most of all the Quran Hold on to the rope of Allah and do not be disunited. Walla tafarraku. After that command in the Quran, it is going to be interesting to see what happens. Nabi Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam has accomplished his mission. He's finished his job. O oh people, he asks from Arafat, have I delivered the message? And they all proclaim, yes, you have. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down revelation. Al-yawm akmaltu lakum deenakum. وَأَدْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي وَرَدِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينًا And so the job is finished to perfection. And we are a united ummah. Will it survive? Will it survive? We know that Dajjal was released in the lifetime of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam. And we know that he is going to try every single trick in the book to try to break us up into bits and pieces, to disunite us. So let's see what's going to happen. Upon the death of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam, the entire ummah united in accepting Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu as Amirul Mu'mineen and the leader the entire ummah with no exception everybody accepted and so there was no dissent and there was no division and there was only unity. Alhamdulillah. And so we are obeying Allah. And then when came the time for his successor, the entire ummah, with no exception, everybody accepted Umar Farooq radiallahu ta'ala anhu as Amirul Mu'mineen and Khalifa. There was no dissent. There were no divisions. And so we remained a united Ummah. Alhamdulillah. We are obeying the command, do not be disunited. And then came his successor. And Uthman Ghani radiallahu ta'ala anhu becomes the Amir al Mu'mineen and Khalifa. And again, there is universal acceptance. Everybody, everybody, everybody accept him 
as Amir al-Mu'minin, as Khalifa. There is no dissent. There are no divisions. We are a united Ummah. Alhamdulillah. And then during the time of his Khilafah, there were certain problems that arose, but not in connection with succession to leadership, not at all. Concerning his administration of the affairs of the Ummah, it had nothing to do with succession to leadership, nothing. And then he was assassinated, Shaheed. And then came his successor Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And yes, there were some voices of dissent, but they did not dissent over theory concerning succession to leadership, not at all. They were dissenting over another issue, unrelated, unrelated to the theory of succession to leadership in Islam. And eventually, the entire Ummah submitted to him. And then there was schism. <laughs> schism, which led to civil war. And then Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu was killed. Like Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And then the Ummah in its wisdom chose his son, Sayyidina Imam Hassan radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Not because of his family. No. If he was appointed as Khalifa because of his family, well, Abu Bakr Siddiq was not family. And Omar Faru was not family. And Uthman Ghani, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, was not family. So if he was chosen as Khalifa, it had nothing to do with family. That theory cannot hold. He, in his wisdom, because of the civil war which just took place, in his wisdom, and may Allah bless him for the wise decision that he took, to preserve the unity of the Ummah, he chose to step down in favor of Amir Ma'awiyah, radiallahu ta'ala that was a wise decision. It preserved the unity of the Ummah for another 28 years. But it was when Amir Ma'awiyah radiallahu ta'ala anhu attempted to institute something which would have been a corruption of the true religion in enforcing the bay'ah in favor of his son Yazid. That the grandson of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam raised the standard of dissent. Sayyidina Imam Hussain radiallahu ta'ala who was a lion of a man. A lion of a man and with great courage and matchless integrity he stood up he stood up against the corruption of the true religion and he stood up against tyranny and oppression and there's one from his family who is coming to complete the unfinished business that he was attending to. Eventually, 
the forces of tyranny and oppression, the forces of corruption of the true faith surrounded him in Karbala. He didn't give up. He didn't compromise. He fought to the end and all those who were with him fought to the end. And all became shuhada. We say tonight, no one is in this gathering will dissent. And none who listen to this lecture in other lands will ever dissent. The Nabi Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam must be proud of his grandson. And that Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha must be proud of her grandson. And that Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu must be proud of his son. What more do you want? And that Fatima to Zahra radiallahu ta'ala anha the daughter of the Prophet and the mother of Imam Hussein must be proud of her son. And this Ummah for 1400 years now as we look back at that moment when he stood up to preserve the pure religion from corruption when he stood up against tyranny and oppression this Ummah has been proud of him for 1400 years now. But there is unfinished business on that battlefield of Karbala. For those who bring monarchy, bring family rule and bring something called a crown prince. There is some unfinished business on the battlefield of Karbala. And when Imam al-Mahdi, when Imam al-Mahdi comes, he's going to finish what was unfinished in Karbala. To bring back the true faith and to sweep into the garbage being monarchy and family rule that the Ottomans brought. Monarchy and family rule that we have in the royal house of Saud in Saudi Arabia. Monarchy and family rule that we have in Qatar and we have in Dubai and we have all over the place and we have in Jordan. It's going into the garbage bin because there's unfinished business, business left at Karbala. And so this Ummah was proud that a movement emerged at Karbala with the assassination with the Mahtaram of Sayyidina Imam Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu a movement emerged a standard of revolt in opposition to counter-revolution a standard of revolt to preserve the true faith from corruption a standard of revolt that the head which bows in worship before Allah will not bow before tyranny and oppression what a wonderful day that was what a wonderful moment that was when this movement emerged but then tragedy stuck this movement was never, never, never intended to disunite the Ummah. This was never intended to be a sectarian movement. No! It is my opinion. And when I give my opinion, you know, please never accept it. Never accept my opinion. Unless you are convinced that it is correct. It is my opinion that Dajjal is the mastermind who now corrupted this movement of dissent, this movement against counter-revolution, 
And this movement now got something called a doctrinal foundation and structure. A strange one. What is it? It said that the entire Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, without exception, were all misguided when they accepted Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu as Amir al Mu'mini. That's strange. And we're going to come back to that. That the entire Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam was mistaken and misguided when they accepted Abu Umar Farooq as Amir al Mu'mini radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Uthman Ghani radiallahu ta'ala as Amir al Mu'mini. This same movement of revolutionary dissent against corruption of the faith now tells us that no it is Allah who decides who rules over this ummah and in another word that it is Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wasallam who appointed in his lifetime appointed his cousin as his successor Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu and so succession to rule in Islam is by divine order restricted to the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam family rule family rule Imam Hussein radiallahu ta'ala and who stood up at Karbala against family rule and the heart the head which bowed in worship before Allah refused to bow before family rule And so now we have the beginnings of a sectarian movement. The major matter which divides the Shia from the rest is this new doctrine that the succession to rule in Islam was divinely ordained was communicated by the Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam and was restricted to the family of the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam. When Imam Imam al Mahdi comes, of course, then everything is going to be cleared up. And there will be no misunderstandings anymore. But even before he comes, it is possible for this lecture to address the subject. What is the truth? Those who choose to believe in this new doctrine, this strange new doctrine, the succession to rule in Islam is divinely ordained and was communicated by the Prophet Islam to be restricted to his family. They came to be known as Shia because they now constituted the first sectarian movement. What a tragedy! What a tragedy that this movement we stood up against corruption, stood up against tyranny and oppression with matchless courage and matchless integrity should now be taken for a ride. What a tragedy. If this speaker is correct, and of course those who 
held to the position that the Ummah was correct when they appointed Abu Bakr Siddiq and Umar Farooq and Usman Ghani as Khulafa, that they were correct. These now came to be known as Sunni. The term Sunni is used in this lecture to refer to those, this doesn't have any doctrinal beliefs in it here. This is the Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. The united Ummah with no, no, no difference. None. Everybody. Hold on to this view. These are called Sunni now. So when we speak of the Shia, the Sunni, this is what we're talking about. This doctrinal division. If this speaker is correct, that the mastermind who took them for a ride was Dajjal. We now must ask the question, why did he do it? What is his scheme? What is his plan? And my answer is that his ultimate plan is to use this division in the Ummah to his advantage in Akhiru Zaman. And that his plan is about to unfold. In fact, it is already unfolding. That his plan is to bring about civil war between Shia and Sunni. That's his plan. The Sunnis may not be aware of it. The Shia may not be aware of it. But I am aware of it. Why does he want to bring about civil war? Number one. At a time when the Zionists are waging war on Islam. Particularly since 9-11. And they're doing it so that Dajjal may be able to move from stage 2 to stage 3. This book, Jerusalem in the Quran, explains the subject. Some of you have read the book. We have it in Bahasa as well. But don't tell me you read, you bought it, said, but Sheikh, I didn't get the time to read it as yet. Because the events are unfolding now which is there in this book 10 years ago. He wants to bring about a change in the rulership of the world. That the United States of America must be brought down so that Israel will replace the United States as the next ruling state in the world. And so a day which is like a month will come to an end. If you find this language strange, it's because you've not read this book. And a day which is like a week will now commence. And during the time of a day like a week, the world which had experienced Pax Britannica and then Pax Americana but of course there's no Pax, it's only deceit and war. We'll now experience Pax Judaica, the rule of Israel. In order for Israel to rule the world, and for Dajjal to eventually emerge in curly here, meaning the curls coming down on the side, eh? not curly here and there. And standing up in Jerusalem and declaring, I am the Messiah, which is probably about 20, 25 years from now. When I give op opinion, I can be wrong, eh? you know that. In order for Israel to rule the world, Israel has to rule over the Arabs. We spoke about that last night. And this booklet, where is it? Here we are. Medina returns to center stage in Akhiru Zaman. This was my topic last night in Subang Jaya. And we have this book in Bahasa and we have this book in Bahasa. Hmm? Outside. Israel has to 
impose its political and economic dominion over the Arabs as a preliminary to ruling over the world. Secondly, Israel has to impose her political and economic dominion over the Muslims, the entire world of Islam. And so Israel will have to wage war. We know for certain that one of the wars that Israel is going to wage is on Egypt. Oh yes. And when those fools with a capital F, I hope, they are listening to me made the alliance with the, with the Zionist NATO to bring down Gaddafi, who was opposed to the Zionists. Those absolute fools who said that they were Mujahideen, in bringing down Gaddafi with the help of NATO, now made Libya a NATO state. NATO is in charge, but they don't know it. Fools with a capital F. And so when the attack comes on Egypt, Egypt doesn't have a chance now. Because Israel will attack from the east, and NATO will attack from the west, and Egypt will be sandwiched in between. We know that's coming. We know that Israel wants to destroy Pakistan's nuclear plants and nuclear weapons and break up Pakistan. We know that. We know that Israel wants to attack Syria. Bring about regime change in Syria so that Syria could become another Libya. And those fools who were so foolish in Libya are equally foolish or even more foolish in Syria. And I'm not talking about the Mujahideen in Syria who have no links with the Zionists, none. And who would rather die than take a penny from Saudi Arabia. Who have no links with Saudi Arabia, no links with Qatar, no links with Jordan, nothing at all. And who are struggling in Syria. I am not speaking about them. Not at all. I'm talking about these fools who say they're Mujahideen and who are in alliance with NATO to bring down this Syrian regime. These are the ones I'm talking about. We're expecting that since they have not succeeded so far, they're going to wage war on Syria. It is in this scenario that we now want to introduce how Dajjal is going to exploit the Sunni Shia division to his advantage in Akhirul Zaman? The answer is he wants to provoke Sunni Shia civil war. That's what he wants to provoke. If he can succeed in provoking Sunni Shia civil war, in the world of Islam, what would be the benefit for him and for the Zionists? Number one, Islam is going to look terrible <laughs> before the entire world on the stage of the world. Look at these Muslims at a time when they are back to the wall, fighting for their very lives. Look at how foolish the Muslims are fighting amongst themselves. Islam is going to look so bad that whatever sentiment there may be in the world sympathetic towards Muslims, even that might be lost. And that will be tremendously advantageous to Israel and to the Zionists and to their propaganda war in CNN and Al Jazeera and the newspapers and the television sets, you can just imagine. They're going to have a field day laughing at the Muslims who are fighting amongst themselves at this time. Number two, the Jal 
will consider it advantageous to provoke a Sunni Shia war because such a war will weaken both the Sunni and the Shia at a time when Sunni and Shia should be trying to build maximum strength and power to resist Israel and to resist the Zionists. Thirdly, Sunni Shia civil war is going to break up Pakistan. There's no way that Pakistan can survive. They are the ones who planned 9-11. And one of the reasons why they planned 9-11 is to be able to get a base in Afghanistan from which to target Pakistan. To attack Pakistan, to destroy Pakistan's nuclear plants and nuclear weapons and break up Pakistan into bits and pieces. They've not been able to do it for 10 years. Even though they had the presidency in their camp, a man named Parvez Musharraf, before he left, the Pakistanis were calling him Dog Musharraf. For 10 years, and this is to the credit of the Pakistani people, that they've not been able to do it as yet. They are actually waiting for civil war. The reason why they have all the drones killing the Pakistani people and even killing the Pakistani soldiers is because they were hoping to provoke civil war in the Pakistan armed forces. But it has not happened so far. Because the Pakistanis knew what they wanted and were denied it. But if they succeed in provoking Shia Sunni civil war in the world of Islam, goodbye Pakistan. But there's a fourth reason why Dajjal, why Dajjal would like to provoke Sunni Shia civil war. I'm going to restrict myself to these four reasons, but I'm sure tomorrow on YouTube you're going to see so many scholars intervening to give us a six and a seven and an eight and a ninth reason and so on. Iran is the Shia country, par excellence. Well, 25 years ago, Iran experienced a spectacular Islamic revolution. I am a student of international relations. And in the, in the language, in the terminology of international relations, we say that that Islamic revolution in Iran was anti-systemic. And so the Zionists were very angry with the revolution in Iran. It not only threatened the Zionists, it also threatened the family kings and royal, royal houses. Because the Islamic revolution in Iran denounced monarchies among the Arabs, denounced it. The Islamic revolution in Iran also had problems for the Soviet Union, who felt threatened. And as a consequence of the revolution in Iran, the Soviet Union intervened in Afghanistan in December 1979, if I am not wrong. The revolution in Iran has produced a government which has consistently for these last 25 years opposed the Zionists. That's not what they want. The Jal doesn't want that. Sunni Shia civil war in Islam, in my opinion, is going to facilitate the effort for regime change in Iran. And so that a regime in Iran which is standing up against Israel, and standing up all the, against all the clients of Israel in Saudi Arabia and Qatar and what have you, 
would be removed and a new regime would come which will be more authentically Shia, sectarian Shia and with which Israel might be able to make a deal that is the biggest advantage of all is it possible for us to do something to prevent Sunni Shia civil war in the world of Islam the Ottomans have already contributed a lot the Ottoman you know the monarchy for 600 years they wage war against the Shia so Sunni Shia warfare to fan the flames of hatred and today the drum beating is taking place when I use the term Protestant Islam by now you all know what I mean by Protestant Islam a version of Islam with a methodology which says the religion is restricted to simply texts the texts of the Quran the texts of the Hadith devoid of the spiritual heart devoid of Nur devoid of Firasatul Mu'min devoid of a capacity to see with the Nur of Allah that Protestant Islam declares that only Allah and his messenger and the Aslaf have the authority to interpret the Quran and to interpret the Hadith that's their position I'm not speaking derogatively about them no I'm not ridiculing them no I'm not disrespecting them I'm not waging war on them no it is this Protestant Islam which is now beating the drums furiously against the Shia taken for a ride by Dajjal who wants to ferment Shia Sunni civil war and so wherever there is Protestant Islam anywhere in the world tonight today you find a people who are obsessed obsessed with beating the drums of war against the Shia one of the ways that we can avoid Sunni Shia civil war is by calling a spade a spade and telling them you are foolish in what you're doing you are playing you are dancing to Dajjal's tune the Zionists have been creating a Shia crescent by attacking Iraq and then bringing about regime change in Iraq with elections while the Americans are in control of Iraq and you have elections and by some magic wand abracadabra that becomes halal a halal government emerges in election that's foolish and now a Shia government replaces the Sunni government in Iraq and we see the the crescent being created by the Zionists to try to present to the world an image of Shia Islam on the ascendancy and Sunni Islam being encircled this is not by accident this is intended to facilitate the brainwashing that is necessary for a Sunni Shia civil war to take place so we need not only to silence those people by calling a spade a spade the drum beaters but we also need political analysis from the, from the member we need the ulama who will have the knowledge and the insight to be able to understand what is happening in the world of politics today in order that the ulama might play a role in preventing Sunni 
Shia civil war from taking place. Because if it does take place, that's it. We will suffer and suffer tremendously. What can we do to prevent Sunni Shia civil war in Islam, which is Dajjal's plan? And which, if it does occur, will bring catastrophe after catastrophe on this Ummah. Pakistan won't survive. I said, number one, call a spade a spade. The same foolish behavior, same foolish conduct, which led to Libya now becoming a Zionist state. The same foolish conduct which could lead to Syria becoming another Zionist state. That is the same foolish conduct which is now beating the drums of war against the Shia, Protestant Islam. Call a spade a spade. Let the Ummah call a spade a spade as part of the effort to try to save this Ummah from civil war. I said there's a role for the ulama and the khatib from the member that the ulama must acquire that political knowledge and insight to understand what is happening in the world today. An alim is supposed to be someone outstanding. Innama yakshallaha min ibadihi al-ulama. Al-ulama warasatu al-anbiya. So the ulama, if they are ulama, must have political knowledge and political insight into what's happening in the world today. And they must stand up on the member and explain to the people so that as a result of what is taking place on the member, we might be able to save the world of Islam from civil war. And finally, there is a role that every single Muslim must play. Wherever in the world you are, whatever the smallest effort that you can make, do make it to try to prevent that civil war from taking place. Now, let us turn to a more serious part of the subject. We said, but well, that's a strange view, isn't it? That the entire Ummah, all Muslims, without a single exception, were all wrong, all misguided? when they appointed and accepted Abu Bakr Siddiq as Amir al-Mu'mineen and Khalifa? What a strange belief! That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who appoints leadership and Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam communicated the leadership is restricted to his family and it commences with Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. How do we deal with this doctrinal division now? The Quran tells us, For in tana'azatum fi shay'in farudduhu ila Allahi wa rasooli. If you are in a state of division, dissent on a certain matter, then take that matter before Allah and his messenger for a resolution of the matter. Meaning, take it to the Qur'an. And only after you have taken it to the Qur'an, only then do you take it to the Prophet because the Qur'an comes first. The Qur'an is the word of Allah. So we say, in order to resolve or to at least try to resolve this issue and I know that there are many Shia who will be listening to this lecture we say it must be taken to the Quran for resolution 
And no hadith can be in conflict with the Quran. And if there is even the appearance of a conflict between what is in the Quran and what is in the hadith, it is the Quran which must prevail. What does the Quran say? We quote only two verses. It's, not, it's enough. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a command in the Quran. Ya ayu alladheena amanu, O you who have faith in Allah. Ati Allah. Obey Allah. Wa ati al Rasul. And obey the Messenger of Allah. Wa uli al amri minkum. And obey those in authority from within your own ranks. So that excludes the Security Council of the United Nations. My teacher of blessed memory, Maulana Dr. Fadur Rahman Ansari, Rahimahullah, commenting on this verse, he says, what Allah means is, obey those in lawfully constituted authority from amongst you. Lawfully constituted authority means constituted in accordance with Allah's law, not the law of the state. Hmm? So obey Allah and obey his messenger and obey those in authority from within your own ranks. That's all Allah says. That's all that Allah says. Where in this verse do we have the <laughs> divinely appointed leadership? Where? Those in authority, how are they constituted? And how do they function? That's the question now. Is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appoints those who are to be in authority amongst you? In another verse of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains, He says, وَشَاوِرُهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ وَأَمْرُهُمْ شُورَ بَيْنَهُمْ That your affairs, أُولِي الْأَمْرِ Your affairs are going to be conducted and determined on the basis of shura, not on the basis of a divine edict. No. And so the Quran is clear. The Quran is clear that there is no basis at all in the Quran for the belief that there is a divinely appointed leadership in Islam that is restricted to the family of the Prophet That is in conflict with the Quran. What then do we do with alleged hadith in which the Prophet is alleged to have appointed Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu as his successor? Our observation is that it is a Massive vote of no confidence in the Prophet You're making him look as the worst possible leader that has ever been on the face of the earth. That he should declare, I have finished my work, I have completed my mission. And then as soon as he dies, every single Muslim disobeys him. Every single Muslim without exception. All of his companions disobey him. By disregarding his alleged command. That Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu must be my successor. It is clear that Nabi Muhammad والسلام, never gave such a command, never gave such an appointment. Not only because of what is in the Quran, because it would have violated the Quran, but also because this, the Ummah spoke. 
Nobody knew about that command. And so it's a little bit late in the day to try to bring in a new doctrine which is not in conformity with the Quran and which would constitute a violent vote of no confidence in Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam. Before we end, there is another issue which stands between the Sunni and the Shia. And it is an issue which can unite the Sunni and the Shia. And that is the Sunni belief in the advent of Imam al-Mahdi. And the Shia most certainly believe in the advent of Imam al-Mahdi. We said to them some time ago that Imam al-Mahdi would not be a Shia, meaning would not be someone who holds on to this belief. The leadership in Islam is divinely ordained and is restricted to the family of the Prophet He will not be a Shia in that sense. But in another sense, he will be taking up what was left over in Karbala. Oh yes. And all the forces of oppression, and all the forces of tyranny, and all the forces of corruption of the faith, by bringing family rule and crown prince and king and so on, will all be running on that day, running for their life when Imam al-Mahdi comes. Because he's going to run them out of town. Oh yes. In that sense, Imam al-Mahdi would be in harmony with the movement that emerged from Karbala. The movement, the revolutionary movement that emerged from Karbala to restore the true faith and to protect the true faith from corruption and to stand up with matchless courage and integrity against oppression and tyranny. That Imam al-Mahdi will continue where Karbala left off. So tell them that for me in Riyadh. But Imam al-Mahdi would not be Shia in this sense. In believing that Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu was a usurper when I was a billah min hadha. And that Umar Farooq radiallahu ta'ala anhu was a usurper when I was a billah min hadha. And that Uthman Ghani radiallahu ta'ala anhu was a usurper when I was a billah min hadha. If that is Shia, Imam al-Mahdi is not Shia. The hadith is that a Khalifa will die. And Khalifa does not stand for a rightly guided leader. Khalifa could be any, any leader. A Khalifa will die. And then there will be dissent concerning succession. My opinion, of course, it's a Saudi king who's going to die. <laughs> and there are 5,000 Saudi princes all lining up to fight for succession. And while that dissension is taking place in respect of succession after that Khalifa dies, then this man is going to come out of Medina and hurry to Mecca. He will have to be someone well known. Of course, he's an Arab, not an Indonesian. He speaks Arabic, not Bahasa, Indonesia. He could <laughs> hurry to Mecca. And when he arrives in Mecca, the people of Mecca are going to come out to him to urge him and to force him to accept the bay'ah at the Kaaba. This is not your normal Saudi. No. This has to be those Saudis who recognize the corruption in the regime 
and whose hearts long for the true Islam that will stand up to the Zionists. Saudi Arabia is now a Zionist state, the American Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. These people are going to come out to him to urge him and force him to accept the bayah. And he will accept the bayah at the Kaaba. I made the observation and let me repeat it again but say it slowly this time because some people don't hear properly. I said that Makkah has never been a Shia city. Did I say that there are no Shia in Saudi Arabia? Huh? <laughs> I said Makkah has never been a Shia city. Is this true or is it false? I said that I do not anticipate Makkah becoming a Shia city. No. In the sense of Makkah accepting this doctrine that succession is divinely ordained and it is restricted to the family of the Prophet and this doctrine we are talking about. I said that it is impossible for Makkah which is not Shia it is Sunni only in this doctrinal sense we are talking for a Sunni Makkah to give the bay'ah to an Imam al-Mahdi who is Shia that's not possible this is a statement I have made and it has been twisted in so many different ways it becomes strange to look at I gave this as my part of my argument that Imam al-Mahdi would not be Shia but when he declares himself to be the Imam al-Mahdi at the Kaaba I know there are going to be lots of Sunnis who will reject him lots of Sunnis who will reject him declare he's a terrorist <laughs> particularly the Sunnis living in the the Zionist lands, you know, Saudi, um, United States of America and Canada and Britain and Europe and so on, and Australia and Singapore. He's a terrorist, says another, you some have been landing out there. <laughs> so some Sunni will accept him and follow him. Some Sunni. This one will say, but he is not the Obandi, so I'm not going to follow him. That one will say, he's not going to be Brailvi, so I'm not going to be following him. That one will say, he's not this one and he's not that. All the sectarian movements in Islam will disown him. <laughs> so who will follow Imam al-Mahdi on that day amongst the Sunnis? My view is very few. And then what will happen to the Shia? I believe that many Shia are going to reject him, Imam al-Mahdi. I believe that there are going to be Imam al-Mahdi's around the corner before the real Imam comes. The Zionists have probably already crafted an Imam al-Mahdi. I heard there's one in Turkey. Let me not mention his name. <laughs> Written a lot of books. <laughs> so, we're going to have a number of Imam al-Mahdi's coming along the road. And it is only those with true knowledge and insight, only they will be able to recognize, nope, that's an imposter. That is not the true Imam. And I fear, I fear, I fear for the Shia, who I consider to be Muslims and therefore my brothers, that many of them are going to be taken for a ride by someone who is going to be an imposter coming along tomorrow and declaring I'm Imam al-Mahdi. When will Imam al-Mahdi come? The answer is in Sahih Bukhari. Kaifa antum, said the Prophet What a wonderful time that would be 
إِذَا نَزَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ نُمَرْيَمْ When the son of Mary will descend amongst you وَإِمَامُكُمْ مِنْكُمْ And at that time your imam will not be George Bush in the White House or Obama or the Security Council of the United Nations because the imam has supreme authority. Eh? But your imam will be minkum, meaning the Khilafah will be restored. Darul Islam will be restored. That is Imam al Mahdi. And so the advent of Imam al Mahdi, I'm going to use a big word now. The advent of Imam al Mahdi is an event which will be contemporaneous occurring at the same time contemporaneous with the return of Nabi Isa alayhi salam this one coming just before that one how much time is there left before Nabi Isa alayhi salam comes do not attempt to answer that question unless you've done your homework and you've studied Ilmu Akhiru Zaman Many of my books outside that I've written are on the subject. Ilmu Akhiru Zama. It is the most important branch of knowledge in Islam today. And it is the one branch of knowledge which is not being taught. Ilmu Akhiru Zama. Please study that subject before you begin to make an estimate of how much time there is left. I always stick out my neck and give a figure. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I know they're going to come after me and say, you're God, only God knows the future. <laughs> no, I stick out my neck and I give a figure. Of course, always saying, I can be wrong, Allah knows best. In order to condition your minds about an approximate time frame, that's all I'm doing, an approximate time frame. By my understanding, we probably have about 25, 30 years left before Nabi Isa salam would come down. Some of my students say to me, Sheikh Imran, you're wrong, it's much less than that. When Imam al Mahdi comes and he proclaims himself Mahdi at the Kaaba, I know at that time. There will be amongst the Shia those who will accept him and follow him. And there will be amongst the Sunni those who will accept him and those who will follow him. And at that time we will not be Shia and Sunni anymore. We would have restored the united Ummah that Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam left. And I want to end the lecture tonight by saying that if that is what is going to come tomorrow you should make the effort from today don't consider all the Shia to be the same and don't consider all the Sunni to be the same there are those whose Qibla is in Washington so do not allow your mind to be corrupted and reach out amongst the Shia for those who will unite into one solidarity in fighting a common battle against a common enemy with the prayer that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will unite us on that day when Imam al-Mahdi returns Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samil alim wa tab alayna ya maulana inna ka anta tawwab rahim bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin ameen